Chaplain Ed Coons will do an opening prayer, then Bill Thomas will take over. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. This day that is that our country set aside to honor all the veterans in all the wars. We ask you to place your healing hand on those who would be here or or that are not here on account of illness and those who are troubled, give them peace. We ask for a, a blessing on the color guard who carried the colors of this country. And also we ask for a blessing on the mothers who gave birth to all of the courageous young men who fought for this country. We ask this in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Good afternoon now, I guess. My name is Bill Thomas. The Klinka name is Klaus Yarrow from the village of Klokwan, Gunnach Tady. I'm here to introduce Senator Dan Sullivan to my fellow veterans. And before we do that, he is a Marine Corps officer, and it is the Marine Corps' birthday today, 241 years. We did celebrate upstairs with a little piece of cake with her, but to the, to the Marine Corps vets, happy birthday, Lieutenant Colonel. Senator. <laughs> uh, Dan is a Iraqi vet. He's, he's a U.S. Senator. I've known Dan for years when he was the Attorney General and the DNR Commissioner for the State of Alaska. I was serving in the legislature. His wife, Julie, they have three daughters. His mother-in-law, if, if people have good memories, Mary Jane Fate, the big Athabasca name in the interior. But this time, I'd like to bring Dan up here, but we're going to do something. I wanted to adopt Dan into my family, Gunnach Tady Whale House, village of Klokwan. I want to do it with my fellow veterans. I think it'd be more of an honor since he is an Iraqi veteran. And I think it's, if you'll let me, it would be a great honor to adopt him in as a brother. Dan, will you please come up here? Chris? I brought my personal vest down. I was supposed to use a blanket, but we didn't have one here, so I brought a vest that I had made for me from Daisy Phillips. We're gonna let Dan use for today, and, and I'm gonna have, uh, oh boy, got my uh, Albert, I have Albert come up. Albert, I think that name is the same nickname my brother had, uh, Kashan, Ka in my, uh, it means old man. So my, and my brother got killed in 1970. So I want Albert to be part of the ceremony with us. And, and uh, David, who his father was also from my clan, the Gunnach Tady and Cluckwood, George Katzik. And we want to bring, I told Dan, don't take any other clinket names till we adopt you into <laughs> us. Because as a warrior, as a warrior, I think it's fitting that he comes from our villages. So with this, we will start. We do out here. Before we start, it's not me that is doing this today. My uncle is here, Peter Jack Tahiti, Uncle Jaish, Charlie Joseph. It is those people, <coughs> my uncles, that are standing here and put this money on his forehead. Ach, ich, ach. Ach, ich, ach. Ach, ich, ach. Ach, ich, ach. 
This money is going to go to somebody who has a connection to that name. That name comes from Bill Thomas's house in Klepwan and goes today to Chris Nas. We have a little plaque here also. Yachish. Yachish means father of the valley. Means if we have trouble in Chilkat Valley, we know who to call now because he is the father. <laughs> the, the name comes from the valley house of which the whale house people were originally from. The house fell apart, so we go back to the whale house. And uh, so I think it's very fitting that the U.S. Senator, my friend, Lieutenant Colonel, and a veteran have this name. I want to say one thing that sticks into my heart when I heard Dan talk of us veterans, and it's a quote that I always use. Those of us who have sh heard and, s and shared the sounds of combat will never forget. Remember that, as I'm sure you do every day. And that's and as an Iraqi vet, a Vietnam veteran, thank you and to my family. Sheesh. Thank you, thank you. What a great honor. Well, listen, um, boy, what an honor. I, uh, I'm, I'm, I want to say I'm speechless, but you know, politicians are never speechless. But thank you, thank you, Bill, Chris, Albert. Um, this is an enormous honor for me. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'll tell a little story here. I'm, I'm very honored to be here. Uh, Dr. Whirl put a lot of this together. Seven years ago, Bill, Bill Thomas invited me when I was Attorney General. Seven years ago to this day, actually, November 10th, uh, the day before Veterans Day, to come down to Juneau and speak to the A and B veterans. Uh, to commemorate Veterans Day. And it was something I was very honored to do. I, I have so much respect for Bill Thomas and so many other of our Alaska Native veterans, all of our veterans. But um, it started for me kind of a, a deep reflection and uh, awareness of what an incredible culture of service to our country we have in Alaska. And as your U.S. Senator, who serves on the Armed Services Committee and the Veterans Affairs Committee, uh, I get to brag about this incredible tradition of military service for all Alaskans. So one statistic that I'm sure you're aware of is that we have more veterans per capita than any state in the country, which is pretty amazing. But the one that I really like to brag about, and I learned as I gave that speech seven years ago here in Juneau, was the incredible record of service that our Alaska Native community has given to our country year after year, decade after decade, generation after generation. And again, that's when I became aware of the fact that Alaska Natives and American Indians serve at higher rates in the U.S. military than any other ethnic group in the country. How about a round of applause for that on Veterans Day? <laughs> and it's what I've referred to as, as a special kind of patriotism, because it is. It's a special kind of patriotism because whether it's World War II 
and the code talkers or all the men and women who served uh, Vietnam, the Korean War. Let's face it, Alaska Natives were out fighting for their country and when they came home weren't always facing a country that was receptive to them. So that takes an incredible special kind of patriotism to do that. And I'm so honored to be here in this ceremony, in this house, um, with so many of our veterans. So I, wanna, I, I wanted to read a quote from a speech I gave a couple weeks ago at AFN. And it's powerful. And the context is uh, AFN was celebrating its 50th anniversary. So I wanted to do a little research on important moments in AFN's history with what Alaskan Native leaders were saying. And there was a kind of a turning point. It was in 1968. Remember, 1968, and for the Vietnam veterans here, uh, they know that was a really difficult year. It was a difficult year for the country. It was a difficult year for our veterans. It was a difficult year in particular if you were serving in Vietnam because it was very bloody during that time. And there was a, a bunch of U.S. senators and congressmen came to Alaska, came to Alaska for field hearings on looking at the La Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. So there was all kinds of testimony before these senators and congressmen who weren't from Alaska, who didn't know a lot about of Alaska, who certainly didn't know about the incredible history of service by Alaska Natives to our country. So they were taking testimony from Alaskans, Alaska Native leaders. And so we read through that, my team and I, we were reading through a lot of this testimony. It was very powerful. And probably the most powerful testimony I read was from an Alaska Native leader named Jerome Trigg. He was from Nome. He was the president of the Arctic Native Brotherhood. And I'm glad to say he was a proud Marine. In his testimony before these congressmen and senators in Alaska in 1968 was said to have brought tears to the eyes of so many people in the audience. And this is what he said. Quote, we have showed our patriotism as proudly as any American on earth. We have answered the call of duty with pride in serving. We answered the call in World War II 100%. Every man, old and young, in every village, volunteered with the Alaska National Guard Remember, this is 1968. Think about what's going on in the country. He said, I have never heard of an Alaska native burning the draft card or burning our nation's flag. We love our lands and we will sacrifice to protect them. Perhaps sensing that that is a lot of moral authority as an American, that kind of service the servant die for your nation in war after war, he concluded his thought with this statement to the senators and congressmen on the dais in these hearings. Quote, sometimes I think the wrong people are running this hearing and taking our testimony. It seems we should be on the bench and you people should be the ones giving us the testimony. I love that. Powerful, it's patriotic, and I think it's accurate. So I just want to end by mentioning, as we are on the eve of Veterans Day tomorrow, that I think sometimes it's important to reflect on how we have treated our veterans year after year, generation after generation, because it's ebbed and flowed. 
And for the young people in the audience, maybe you don't know how much it's ebbed and flowed. But let me give you an example of how it's ebbed and flowed. After World War II, where Alaska Natives served with heroism all across the world, our veterans came home. Over 400,000 Americans were killed in that war. And they came home to ticker tape parades. And even today, we honor them with honor flights to Washington, D.C. And they've been given the name the greatest generation. So they got the highest level of respect. And of course, they deserved it. They still deserve it. And if we have any World War II veterans in the audience today, I'd be honored if you could raise your hand or be recognized. But that's where we were as a country, the highest honor for our veterans who served. And then the Korean War came, only five years later. And that began, began a period of what I call benign neglect. Many parts of society in America did not really seem that interested in thinking about the tens of thousands of American military veterans, including thousands of Alaska natives who served or who were killed, over 8,000 are still missing in action, over 100,000 wounded in the Korean War. And even the name of that war now, which is called the Forgotten War, shows a little bit of that neglect. I don't like that name, the Forgotten War. I like the name of the war referenced in the Korean War. If you're ever in Washington, D.C., and you see the Korean War Memorial, and you go there, there's four words etched on that memorial that are very powerful. Freedom is not free. That's what that memorial says. But there was this almost neglect. It wasn't like World War II way up here. It was just coming down a little bit for the respect. And if there are any Korean War era veterans in the audience, if you could raise your hand or be recognized. And then we got to the Vietnam War. And for whatever reason, the respect that American society bestowed on our veterans hit rock bottom. We went from here in World War II down to rock bottom with regard to Vietnam. And we've all heard the stories, and unfortunately they're true, of Vietnam vets coming home not giving any respect, indeed being spit on or yelled at. And these are just young men and women who are answering the call to service. And a lot of them were from Alaska. And a lot of them were, for Alaska, were from Alaska Native communities. But here's the amazing thing and why our country owes such a debt of gratitude to our Vietnam vets. Instead of being bitter, or incapacitated by anger, what they did was an amazing, amazing thing. They set out to make sure that future veterans of America's wars and their fallen comrades would receive better treatment than they got, would receive the highest honors, like in World War II, something that they didn't get and yet they worked so hard to make sure that happened. And I told a story earlier today to our veterans. I had a Marine uh, who was killed and I was uh, at a service burying him at Fort Rich in Anchorage. There was a bunch of Marines there. And I was a captain at the time. I was the officer in charge of the service. And at the beginning of the service, Four veterans pulled up on Harley Davidsons, big motorcycles, Vietnam veterans. And they just pulled up and attended the service. And at the end, they came up to me. 
And I thanked him for being there, but I was a little curious. And I said, did you guys know my Marine? They said, nope. We just read about it in the paper that he was being buried, and we want to make sure he got the respect and dignity that he deserved. So for the veterans today who come home from difficult challenges overseas, Vietnam or Iraq or Afghanistan, and when they come home, guess what happens in the airports and at home? You get patted on the back. You get thanked. You got young kids coming up saying thank you for your service. And it's a beautiful thing. It's back at the levels that we should be as a country. And I've experienced it myself. But guess who, guess who is most responsible for that, from my, from my view? It's our Vietnam era veterans who made sure that what happened to them didn't happen to the next generation of veterans fighting for their country. So I want to thank and ask anyone who served in Vietnam or during the Vietnam era to please stand and receive a hearty thank you from your fellow Alaskans and fellow Americans. Please stand. So I'll just end by letting you know, hopefully you see, I feel very passionate about these issues. I'm not an emotional guy. This is like the only thing in the world besides my wife and daughters that can choke me up. But um, whatever we can do, whatever I can do as your senator to serve you, please be assured that we will continue to do that, including pushing for the passage of the Alaska Native Equity Allotment Act, which I think is only fair to make sure Alaska Natives serving during the Vietnam era get an opportunity to apply for their native allotment. They missed that chance because they were serving their country when many other people weren't. Those are the kind of things we're going to continue to push on. But I'm just honored here. Bill, thank you again, sir, um, for the great honor of being brought into your clan. I will cherish that forever. And I want to honor, again, your incredible special patriotism that should make all Alaskans, and to be honest, all Americans, proud of you. Thank you very much. I like the, I'm the commander for Southeast Alaska Native Veterans. And we uh, just heard of speaking to Senator Sullivan after our last meeting. So what I'd like to recommend and ask for a motion that we make Senator Sullivan an honorary Southeast Vets. Uh, and uh, from the veterans out here, I ask for a motion for that. Thank you, Mr. Commander. I make a motion asking unanimous consent that Senator Dan Sullivan be brought into the Southeast Alaska Vets. In discussion? Ready for a question then? All in favor of this motion from veterans, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's carried. Bill? <laughs> the, the color is uh, Alaska Native Brotherhood colors, but you can call it a Marine Corps color too if you want. <laughs> he came to talk to us, and I thought it was your good. Thank you. Thank you. Kakuyukadusak, Tequidiahat, Koshkokonyahat, 
Uh, my name is Joe. I'm chairman of the Sea Alaska Board, and I want to thank you all for uh, attending today. And I will also I'm uh, making the transition here, uh, and I know that we're we're multitasking, and we're good at that as Native people. We're able to take care of um, all kinds of business and keep many things moving. But th this month is Native American History Month. And at Sea Alaska Heritage, um, there's been a number of years of activities happening during that, that month. And in the Dr. Walter Soboloff Center, we're, we're having these doings. And Sea Alaska and Sea Alaska Heritage, for this Native American uh, History Month, we're dedicating it to you, the vets. Um, and you know, there's never enough that we can do for our vets. So this is just a small gesture for this month, for all the programming this month that we're doing, uh, is um, dedicating it to the vets. And Rosita, Dr. Worrell, is going to talk a little bit more of the program today, but I think they're also going to take care of some other business here with, um, with our Senator Sullivan. So thank you for being here. I'm just sharing that um, this is your month um, uh, at the Heritage Center for all these activities. Uh, thank you very much, Joe. Uh, most, most honorable vets, most honorable vets, and our very, now very beloved Chak Ish. Chak Ish. Oh, oh, oh. Ish. We are so proud to have you welcomed into our Tlingit culture and into one of our greatest and nobles clans, the Ganok Teidi. The Ganok Teidi are among the oldest clans in Southeast Alaska. They moved from the Southern to the Northern area. They were present in all of our communities. So it is just absolutely fitting that you would be given this great name from the Ganok Teidi clan. But we also wanted to dedicate this entire month to our vets our vets who have protected our homeland. It is fitting that we are having it here in this clan house. This clan house that is flanked with our traditional warriors. Our traditional warriors who always protected the homeland, who always protected the ownership of this land for the first people. So see Alaska, and Sea Alaska Heritage wanted you to know how very special you are to us, how we appreciate all of the work, the sacrifice, and the sacrifice of those of our children, our brothers, our fathers, our uncles, who did not return homeland, who did not return to our home. So what we wanted to do in this month was to begin with our traditional warriors and end with our traditional warriors. But we wanted to begin this segment honoring those who are yet among us. And so we will be showing a film of the Huna vets. Very unfortunately, some of our vets who are uh, in Huna, who are featured in the film, were not able, the plane was not able to make it into Juneau. But we do have other vets who are, were involved in that film. And they will be coming on after we show the film. Uh, we'll have a panel discussion uh, with those vets, uh, along with Ozzie Shakley and Bill Thomas. But I also wanted to tell you that in the next week, we will also be honoring our Clinket Code Talkers. We know that we now know, we did not know until just recently, that we had five Clinket Code Talkers among the ranks of Navajo and other Native American Code Talkers. So we are having a special session just on those Clinket Code Talkers. We, we wrote about what we knew about them. There are some we know more about, some of them we don't, we know less about. But we wrote about them because we are going to put this into our curriculum. We are going to put this into our educational material so that our children, the children in Southeast Alaska, the children in Alaska, 
will know about our Clinkett Code Talkers that serve this country in a very admirable way. But before we begin that film, uh, we have another naming ceremony. Now, I want you to know, and I know most of you know, but for those of you who might not know, names are property in our clan. They are handed down from generation to generation, and I know that this, this name is thousands and thousands of years old because it, ref it refers to a place name uh, in our homeland. But these, these names are owned. And what it does for people, it assures us of a symbolic immortality. Senator, you are going to live forever through your name. Your name will be passed down to the next generation and you will live on through that name. So if we might, I'd like to call on David Katzik to do another one of a very sacred ceremony of naming ceremony. He's going to, we're going to practice with him. Chak ish. Owe. Chak ish. Owe. Chak ish. Owe. He got it. Give him an A. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Well, the screen is coming down. This is a documentary uh, done by a lady in New York. Her name is Samantha Farinelli. Someone's telling stories in the back yet. Okay, this documentary was... Uh, Took her about a year to do, and she interviewed all of our veterans. So many of them aren't even inside here, but it's only because she didn't have enough time to put them all in there. But what they shared with us in here is probably something that'll be hard to share right here. Uh, it was already hard for them to say that, but listening to them inside here will be something to hear. So in fact, I've never seen anything like this in any other documentary. She showed it around the country this last year, and it's won a few awards well, because of the way she did it. And she called it Hunting in Wartime. And uh, after it's over, I think no, you know, this ask any of the veterans that are familiar with it, just to uh, offer their own comments instead of calling on someone after it's over. This is Hunting in Wartime, I guess you're ready. I can tell you where I come from. Through history books, they say we came across some land bridge, and we always said we never did. We've always been here. Each clan has their own history. Our clan is called the Shungukadi clan. Years and years and years ago, there were five boys and one girl up at the sun. Their father with the son. And their father, the son, said, we're going to lower you back down to the ground down here because that's where your people's from. They never left their father before. So he said, I'm going to make you a big basket. I'm going to make it big enough to hold seven and a little bit more. And I'm going to lower you down from the son. And he had made the dog go with them. The dog's name was Ha Ha. He said, if you guys ever get scared anything at all, pull the string and I'll pull you back up.
when I went through the basic training, when I first started, he come across a couple of Indians in, on base there, and he says, uh, you give me 20 push-ups, you tell them those Indians. He didn't say anything to those uh, white soldiers. Colonel come over. How come you're so tough on the Indians? He said, I know these Indians. They're from my hometown. They're tough. And they could take it. This is Rebel 6, request dust off. Dust off, over. This is Rebel 6, request dust off. Request dust off. I've always been a pretty peaceful guy until I'm 18, 19 years old. When I grew up, I wanted to be a hunter and a fisherman, and I could do both of them. Every time somebody, I get a chance to talk to somebody, <laughs> uh, I tell them we're Aboriginal. Before and you shoot a deer, we used to say a little prayer for them, you know. You cut a tree down, and you go there and give him a morning blessing. Now that's the way my grandpa taught me. If you're going to cut it down, you go around it, chant your little song, and then you cut it down. I started learning always. Like my uh, maternal grandfather would anchor, would go ashore, we had our little axe. I went there, oh, I'm going to start chopping this. Tlack, tlack. No, no, don't. It's It's, you know, you can't do that. It's taboo. He started talking to the trees. Talk to so we're getting ready for winter. We need your leaves to uh, use to smoke our salmon in our smokehouses. We won't, we only take the, amount we need, we'll leave a lot for you. Yeah. Everything has a spirit, everything. Everything has life, even a rock has life. Dirt has life, everything has life. We go out deer hunting, 10 and 11 years old. I mean, you know, we're not much bigger than that. These gut shot we call trophy hunters, shoot them in the heart. We shoot them in the head, and that way if you missed, you went home hungry. <laughs> and we've done it all our lives. I had a 22 single shot. You didn't have to teach you more than once because you had to learn when, when they said, this is something you remember, you remember it. You know, because if you ask you next time, I'll have to get swatted on the head. Well, I remember when I was five years old, I had walked up to Huna. I was going to walk back. He had a skiff. Come on, the skiff. I'll take you back. Do you know how to swim? It's said, Slack, no. Do you want to learn? Yes, my uncle's going to teach me. You know, that's my thinking. Okay. Got up the skiff. He just grabbed me and threw me. I hit the water and he hollered me. If you don't start swimming, you're going to drown. And I'm not going to help you. He started rowing away. That's the way I learned. <laughs> A good uncle. <laughs> when you get your first fish, your first deer, you go to the eldest first in your, in your clan to give it to them. Because without them, you wouldn't be where you're at. 
because they're the ones that teach you your skills. They're the ones. This is all not book learning. This is real life learning. This is something you're never going to see in a book. Back in the 40s, the 50s, our people decided that in order for us to survive as a nation, that we would not teach them the language. I'm half Finn, quarter Italian, and quarter Plinket. But in the, like in the John Wayne movies, you got brown skin and you're part Indian, you're all Indian. And the only good Indian's a dead Indian. Remember that movie? Oh, I hated that. I remember when we were kids, we wouldn't even play, we didn't, when we were playing cowboys and Indians, nobody wanted to be the Indian. No, they always die. No. <laughs> We've had discrimination in Alaska forever. There used to be signs down in Franklin Street on the bars, no dogs and no Indians. Do not come into this restaurant, do not use that outhouse and go to your own place. And I grew up with a lot of hatred. I really did. We all spoke with it. First grade, I started learning because my wrists were swelling all the time. The teacher would come with a ruler, ah, speak English. I said, what's English? You know? <laughs> when I was really small, my uh, grandmother said I could understand and speak Tlingit fluently. And then when I left, and I must have went to foster parents and lived with them for a number of years and then came back. And I don't know what happened, transpired there, but she came back and she said something to me and I think it, and I didn't respond and she asked her daughter and I think it, what was wrong and she told her and Tlingit that I'd gone and lived with some white people and that the language, I didn't understand the language. friends sometimes, you know, we'd run and tell the teacher that Marlene's talking, and we didn't call it Clinkett then, it was, it was called Indian. Marlene's talking Indian. And so I spent a lot of recesses inside on the blackboard writing, I will not talk Indian. They whipped us or spanked us with a stick or put Tabasco sauce in our mouth or taped our mouth up. My mom didn't teach us to speak Clinkett because when she was going to school, she was punished in school for speaking Clinkett, so she kind of held us from that. Nobody in our family wanted to talk about it, and I always bothered me. Why? Why? Teach us our own language. They were afraid to because we would get beaten up. Because they wanted us to be assimilated into white man society because they thought that we would have a better chance. Not their fault. It isn't their fault. Okay, move out. Well, we thought they were joking around. And now you'll be going to Vietnam when you get out of high school if you don't go to college. A whole graduating class of 1966 when the military, with the exception of the girls. I was a fisherman. My draft letter came from the President of the United States. It says, uh, Dear 
Anthony G. Mills. You are now inducted into the Armed Forces. Signed, the President of the United States. I volunteered for the services because my older brother had two kids and one was still shit and yellow, you know. I wasn't going to go to school no more. I told my brother that I was going into service for him. And he got mad, but, you know, that's tough. Well, I knew it was in Oregon, but I didn't know where. So we all started looking at the chart. We didn't have much of a TV here then. Just one or two people had it. Most of them, you just go to the movie hall and see it on the newsreel. It seems ironic that while our finest young men are fighting halfway across the world, other young men and women, safe at home, openly advocate abandonment of Vietnam to communism. Perhaps they really don't know what this war is all about. In the words of a battle-weary young Marine, they would understand if they'd cross this 10,000 miles of ocean and live with us. Only a couple of years ago, these young men would have been embarrassed to tell what patriotism meant to them, how much they loved their homes, their God, their country. Now they daily risk their lives for their beliefs. This vast cross-section of America, it's young, tired, gallant fighting men, this is not only the face of America, this is the heart of America. I don't know any of us that served out of here, ever went to Canada or went 4F or dodged the draft. If they did, I don't know about it. I'm not sure whether it is because it makes you equal with everybody else. You know, I really don't. That's something that we all we're very, very proud of, you know, you have that pride of, uh, in the country. As far as I know, everybody that served just went. They went. Standing around talking to Joe. Standing around talking to Joe. Nothing to do, nowhere to go. Booth camp was, uh, I was a little stronger than most of those kids down there. We grew up hunters and fishermen and working hard, you know, everyday life is hard work as a child. Chopping wood, carrying water, such, you know, in smaller villages, and you, you, you grew up outside. Basic training was nothing to most of us here that left. We talk about it. It's a big smile and joke, laugh. In the military, in the big train, they had these logs that rolled across, you know, and you had to jump on. That's nothing. <laughs> that was just so easy, it was just ridiculous, you know. And they used to make us stay all these walls, you know, and we used to do that all the time and climb the cliffs over here when we were kids. I thought maybe it was because of how I grew up on a fishing boat. When you go out fishing on these fishing boats, it doesn't matter if you're, it's raining or sunshine and you have on rain gear, you're going to get soaking wet anyway because you sweat so much. Pulling in the sand, it comes in fast. It's very competitive fishing. It's uh, dog eat dog out there. After all the training, we figured we were ready. There were five boys and one girl up at the sun. They were leaving their father for the first time. He said, don't forget, get scared, pull the string. He started lowering them down from the sun. And the daughter looked over the basket and she got scared right away. She pulled the rope and their father, the son, pulled them back up to the sun. He said, what's wrong? You're lowering us into fire. So the father looked down there. He said, that's just the clouds in the sky. They're not going to hurt you. 
they felt better. I finally got my orders when I was in Fort Lee. You go to Vietnam, pack your bags, you gotta go home for a month. So I came home and went fishing for my last time in Indian Islands. For uh, Vietnam, everybody laughing, joking. I thought, holy cow, how could these guys be laughing? But it was all a front. It started getting quiet. There were a lot of worried looks, boy, and there were a lot of tears. All the guys were really actually going to war. This is it. everything, the palm trees, the really pretty beach, the, the warm sunshine. It was like paradise. It was just, wow, so neat, you know. But uh, the idea of it being neat wore off fast enough. Are you guys have any, anybody here any comments about it? Comments. Comments? Oh, Royal's here too. Wow. Heard it's really windy. How do you guys do it? <laughs> Royal. Thank you, Ozzy, for that uh, narrating there. <laughs> but anyway, I'm a man of few words, but um, give me about an hour, and I'll change that. No. <laughs> Um, I just want to thank everyone who uh, was responsible for putting this on, on behalf of the vets. And um, I'm proud of each and every one of them. But um, you wish that over time things would change. And from what I've seen over these years, and especially watching this last election, I can see here in this country, we are still dragging our feet when it comes to certain things, and especially for our native peoples. We've been struggling since the lands claims to get things that were deser deserved to the native peoples. And each and every one of these young, fe young fellows, <laughs> as I knew them years ago, were willing to give their lives for this country. And as far as I'm concerned, I think it's time for this country to show that respect which they honestly deserve. And when it comes to things like, you know, hunting and fishing and native land rights, the landless people, and there's many other issues that should be addressed. There isn't a native sitting here that hasn't, at one time or another, faced death for his country, the same as I. But I'm not a violent person, and none of these guys are, no. I, there's some times in my life where I've done things that I'm, I'm ashamed of. But I, you know, I, I, res I went into alcohol and drugs for the first eight years when I came back. But I did quit after, after that, and I quit for over 30 years. It's really hard for me to piece together everything that's running through my head. 
because throughout the years I've seen many things come and go and change. But sometimes you wish for, they were for the better. But a lot of times they're not. And I know the Native people are proud, good people. And you'll never see a Timothy McVeigh amongst their Native peoples. I'm not downing people. I'm just saying the Native people are good people. I, I, I don't really have much more to say. I'm sorry. It's just uh, thank you, Ryle. I'm not um, I'm not bitter. I'm more hurt than bitter. I wish I'd see some change, some positive changes for our Native peoples. And education, as I've always believed, is a key to any nation's survival. And as Native people, we need to work together to try to do what's right and educate our people. I really feel that. Violence isn't always the answer, and that's what Vietnam was, violence. And violence, it was, I guess, in some, some cases, wasn't justified, and a lot of good men died for a cause. And that was democracy. And each and every one of us, that's what we were fighting for, democracy. And we're willing to give our lives for that. Hey, thank you, Royal. Give Royal a hand, could we? That sure everyone knows uh, we lost Victor Bean, otherwise he'd probably be with us now too. This year. James? Yeah, I like to say a few words about Nam. I went to Nam in sixty seven with a hundred first airborne, one eighty seven Rockerson Company E. I started off as recon. I ended up in Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol because our 3rd Brigade wiped out. They came into our hooch and told us we weren't recon anymore. And Darty told us. Went outside and they gave us new hats and uniform. Then we came LERPs. I started my airborne in Fort Bragg. And they teamed the Airborne Corps, the Dragon. I saw somebody I recognized right up by it, the way he walked. Looked like he was lost. And I played ball against him in high school. And his name is Bill Thomas in Fort Bay. I got fortunate enough to type out his orders to Fort Campbell. And uh, now I'm I worked in personnel specialist. I went to special ops in Fort Bragg, which we didn't know what it was. Our buddy signed us up for it. And now I thought the airborne training was hard, but it just got a little worse and a little. But the happiest moments I always talked about when I ran into Victor and we talked, because we both carried M60 machine gun. His dad carried machine gun in the Second World War. I ran to Ron Greenwald after we had the Tet in an embassy building where BC were trying to take over. We went to Bearcat where Don. I never saw a place so wild, sandbag with those water pipes you guys had over and over you guys. I mean, that was. <laughs> I have to come back from Doc Toe and Doc Peck and come down to Bearcat. And I never seen a place like that. It was, a, it was a fort. We were getting ready to go down. We knew someone was up. And that's when I ran into, we were done after they were tet, they tried to get take over the embassy building. I never saw so many MPs killed and and the deuce and a half, and that's a big truck. And, and after that, we went to Crew Chi in the 25th mechanized unit. They were supposed to get run over. I burned out my M60, my gun bearer and I went in. We followed our nose to uh, where they sold hamburgers, hot dogs, and milkshake. And I heard a familiar voice. 
And then I told Ramsey, that sounds like Roe Hill. I snuck up behind him. I told him, you know, that there's a war on. He was shooting pool. We had a lot of fun when we were together. Three times I ran into him over there. We stole some jeeps. Three, four in the morning. Mm -hmm. I had a good time. Then the second time was George Bennett. Virgin Mountain, Black Virgin Mountain, they call it. They were supposed to run that place over, and I burned out that machine gun again. When that thing gets hot, it don't stop. That's like a 30 out six shell going off. 200 rounds a minute somewhere. That depends on how bad of trouble you are. I ran into George McKinley, I told him. He was playing basketball. And I told him, he can't play basketball either. McKinley, he looked at me. Nobody calls him McKinley because he was Bennett. And that's his younger brother at the other end, Freddie Bennett. We fished together on the USS Port Frederick, we call it. Learned how to fish. We pull share. He was a nun before us. And this was all 67, 68. I went into Cambodia when I went to Laos. And Laos, I seen the biggest cat I ever seen, all of us, six of us that were in there. And I was a tiger. I never see so many rifles go up and put in automatic so fast. They weren't scared of a VC or NBA. And that thing was big. The tiger. I like to talk about the good times, but this is a few. I like to get out, and, and I came back home on Friday the 13th, September 68. I landed in Travis Air Force Base in California, September 13th, Friday the 13th. <laughs> I get to celebrate Friday the 13th twice. And I have my younger brother here. He was in the 11th cab. Uh, James, what slurp? You said you were a lurp. Long range, reconnaissance patrol. Six-man team. I think they're the ones that went out before everyone else, these guys. Anybody else have any comments? Maybe? Donald? The oldest guy up here, Donald. <laughs> yeah, for about 25 to 30 years, I had a grudge against Vietnamese. I mean, I could look at one, if I had one beer, I was going to take that guy down. And when I quit drinking, I was sitting there talking to this one guy, and and I asked him, what are you? You're not Alaskan. He says, I'm Vietnamese. And all of a sudden, my hair on the back of my head stood up. And I says, uh, how old are you? He says, I'm only 20. I says, for Christ's sake, I'm, you weren't even born when I was over in your country. And uh, I, it took me a long time to think about it. I sat there and had to really go through all my little scruples at saying, well, this guy was killing me not too long ago. But it was uh, okay up until about three days ago. My doctor come walking in, and pretty little lady, and she, uh, she says, I heard you don't like uh, certain uh, certain people. And I said, no, I just don't like Vietnamese people. And uh, she said, I was born in Vietnam. And right then I said, wow, you used to be one of my targets. And uh, I've been feeling bad about that ever since because 
we're all together now, I hope. And that was all I wanted to say. All right, thank you, Don. It's good to share with you to share it. Thank you, Don, too, I guess. Any questions or comments up here yet? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to share my uh, experience over in in Nam. I was supposed to go over to the about the safest place in Nam, I guess, which was Cameron Bay, but I got storm bomb in Huna for a day, and the next day I flew out. I uh, got as far as California, and I was lost. I was the only guy in the military suit over there, and I went to the MPs and asked them, uh, could you help me? I'm behind my unit. They just said, follow us. I didn't know then. They threw me in a paddy wagon. <laughs> and, uh, and I, I didn't know then. They took me in a place called the Presidio, left me there for a couple of months. <laughs> Well, it wasn't only me, it was a couple other guys, and they finally shipped us all out, and uh, then they, they didn't know where we belonged to, and they called us a detachment outfit and started shipping us to different units, and I didn't know who I was supposed to be with. And about, oh, pretty close to six months later, I finally caught up to my unit, and they took me up to Cameron, and they didn't know what to do with me, so they tried to have me repair shoots. I didn't know how, I forgot. After being out in the bush for a little bit, and and uh, so they had me driving trucks, driving the trucks to pick up uh, the parachutes, and I got a flat, and I didn't know how to fix a flat. So they changed me to be a pole climber. And uh, so that's what I did. I climbed poles and wired up the barracks. And they asked if I want to go back out. I said, sure. And uh, so they shipped me back out. And that's when I, I uh, lost my good friend. Uh, uh, I guess he was a friend. I'm not sure. His name was O'Shaughnessy from New Jersey. Uh, it's 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 pretty hard to keep on thinking about him. I try not to. I try I try to stay busy by going to school. I had great uncles out there who told me to go to school, and that's what I did. I went to electrician, lineman, electrician, wireman, plumbing and heating, and refrigeration, and welding and that was the work I've done ever since I've been here. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments up here? Questions out there? <laughs> Something out there? Oh. Hey, Norman. Yeah, my name is Norman Sarabia and uh I grew up fishing with our dad out Indian Islands, too, with you guys, too. And I just wanted to say I'm very proud of all you guys, and I'm glad that you guys served for us. Thank you very much for all you guys did. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Norman. Oh, this, oh it's okay. Oh. Hi, everybody. Um, sorry, that video was a little emotional for me. I know all of you. Um, my husband's Johnny Hinchman, and I had the honor and pleasure of knowing all of you in Huna, and I thank you for everything. I'm very honored to have met you guys. Thank you. Sorry. Hey, thank you. Any other Questions or comments up here? Hi, 
I just want to, uh, <clears throat> my name is Phyllis Carlson, and um, I just want to thank you for sharing, being here today. I'm of your generation. I had friends who went to Vietnam from my part of the state. I come from Kodiak in the Alaska Peninsula. And um, I'm very humbled to be in your presence here today, and I want to thank you. And Ozzy, I want to thank you um, as well. I've worked with you for years, and I want, I want to thank you for all the work that you've done on behalf of making the community aware of the contributions of our veterans and, and the sacrifices and the um, pains and the memories and, and the brotherhood that you all share. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Hey, thank you, Phyllis. <clears throat> I'd like to thank you, gentlemen, for your service. I really appreciate it. And uh, I thank you for sharing your story with me. It's been real helpful and healing for me and Kunashish. Thank you. Last one. I'm the last one. Okay. <clears throat> First off, I'd like to thank all of you for being here and apologize for us for being so late, but can't control Mother Earth, uh, Mother Nature, you know, so we made it in. It's hard to believe that it's been 51 years since I served in Vietnam. It was my first experience leaving the village and going into basic training, meeting different people from different walks of life. I remember getting off the plane and in Taunts in uh, Vietnam, Taunts New Air Base. And the first thing that I really noticed was the smell, really powerful. And I remember walking off the plane and looking down and looking around in this strange country I had landed in that I knew nothing about, I'd never ever heard of. Didn't even know who these people were. I had no idea there was a Vietnam War going on. And I remember they lined us all up and told, uh, told us to go and have chow and then come back in the hall and assemble and we'll start sending guys out to your units. And I waited three days to leave Tonsoon before I got sent out. As I was they called us and told us where we're going. I found out I was going to a unit in a place called Quinon, Vietnam, out on the South China Sea. And I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what was going to happen. I knew nothing about these people. And I wondered what the heck I was doing there. I remember getting off the bus, going into the compound, a whole different, different world altogether. Constantino wire everywhere, everywhere, weapon emplacement here, there, every place, you know, and you had to check yourself through the gate, you had to check yourself out of the gate. You couldn't go here, you couldn't go there. You pushed the most restricted to where you were at at the time. You were forbidden to go into town, although we did get passes. And my first job that I had there was company clerk. And then they needed a mail clerk, so I moved over and became the mail clerk. And that was the highlight of the day, mail call. That was a big one. I mean, everybody looked, everybody looked forward to mail call. When you said mail call, you better have mail. Because everybody came running from everywhere to get mail. And you could pretty much tell who got John Deere letters. That was the hardest part I ever heard. I, I never knew what the hell that was until I saw it happen in front of me. This young kid got a John letter. Went out and shot himself. You think that don't affect you for the rest of your life? To know that somebody that you worked alongside, you were with him, and he was gone. 
The Vietnam War really affected us, and it, affects, it still affects me 51 years later. But it affected us in a different way. When World War I and World War II were fought, the guys in the Korean War, and they were all heroes when they came home. They had parades, they had, you know, everybody was waiting over them, and everybody was looking for them to come home. But in Vietnam, during the Vietnam War, the media saturated so much of Vietnam news and everything that they lumped us all together and stereotyped us all together as being doing the same things that very few of us did. If you paid attention to the movie, you saw the part that Victor Bean Sr. talked about the aristocrats that went on in there, the things that happened while he was on patrol. Not all of us were like that, but we got lumped together because of that. I was called a baby killer. I'm sure every one of these guys here got the same treatment. They didn't come up and ask us, hey, where'd you serve at? Hey, did you, what'd you do? No. Yeah, you serve in Vietnam? Yeah. <laughs> Are you serious? We weren't gonna tell anybody we served in Vietnam with the way the media had betrayed us. We were getting spit at, having eggs thrown at us, have people talk down to us. Here we went, signed the same blank check that our uncles before us, our grandpas before us signed, and we got treated different. Think about it. What it was like for us to come home, <clears throat> see garbage cans full of military uniforms because they did not want to wear them home because they knew what was going to happen. Guys were getting beat up because they were wearing a uniform. They didn't ask that guy if he, if he, if he, what he did in Vietnam or if he had served in Vietnam or not. He was wearing a uniform. Didn't make any difference. Young kids protesting the Vietnam War. It's time for us to tell our story. The American people told their story when we came home. They told us the way it was going to be. And because of that, we, act, we had to react and protect ourselves, too. So we reacted the way we did. We pulled back, regrouped, and made a decision. OK, I made my own decision. I'm not telling them. nobody has heard of Vietnam. If they ask me, I'm a veteran, I'm going to tell them no. And it cost me jobs, good ones. And I used to think about this. 51 years I've been thinking about this. I've been thinking about it, looking at it from every angle I could think of. When I was in one drunkenest part, you know, I was just, I'd get mad. I'd just fly off the handle. I'd be so, I, was, I was just mad at the American people for the way they treated us. Because my uncles remember what it was like when we came back from them. When they came back from war, they had somebody waiting for them. Everybody was glad to see them and everything. I'll tell you this day, they weren't glad to see us because of the news media. They were afraid of us. Peek out the window at you, you're walking by. Don't look at you in the street, look down. Don't greet you. Hey, Vietnam veterans, stay away from me, it's not good. It's gonna hurt you. It wasn't just me, it was all of us. Every one of us that served with Vietnam that happened to us. Everywhere. I run into guys on the street, man. And then first thing is, is hey, you served me yet? No? No, I walk away and they go, hey. It took us a long time to get where we are today, where we actually talk about it. But we're real careful about when we do it. I am really surprised that this film has brought out as many people as it has. The viewings are just, I mean, the people, the church was just full of people and the viewings that I went to. And the thing is about it, ladies and gentlemen, the stigma that it was put on us, we didn't deserve it. Not one of us deserved it. We were really treated different in World War I, World War II, and Korean veterans, and we know it. But by the same token, I was in Seattle three years ago, and this young soldier came walking up to me, 
and I was wearing my Vietnam hat, and he stuck out his head, I want to shake your hand. I said, why? And he said, because of you, we do things different in the field. We learn from you guys, and we're starting, we're doing it differently. And I want to thank you. And that's the first time Emmett ever came up, another soldier tell me something like that, because of what I did in Vietnam, they're changing the way they do things in the field and stuff like that. That was amazing. I've never had that happen. But I want to say one thing, you know, I hope people continue to listen to what we have to say. Because a lot of hurt guys out there, there's guys committing suicide, guys in depression, the guys that will not go to the VA to get help because of the way they were treated after they came back from Vietnam. We've been hiding it a long time, ladies and gentlemen, trying our best to deal with it in our soul and in our heart trying to live our lives the best way we know how to raise our families, to be a part of our community, to, to be here for each other. When the worst things happen is we come together. But we still have our moments when we look at each other and go, wow, I can't believe we did that. I can't believe we went there. And then it was right on, we can't believe our people, our own people treat us like that. It was pretty rough. It was pretty rough, and it's still rough today, too, when I think about it. It's not easy. It's not easy at all. No, we just need your understanding, because there was a different time and place when we came home, and we weren't even welcome at home. We weren't. I, you know, I worked in uh, LCM-8, Landing Craft Mechanized Landing Craft, in Queen Anne, Vietnam, unloading ships, liberty ships. And the way we did it, I, I liked working nights. For some reason, I don't know why that was. I just did, and you know, I liked working. So what they do, they send us out, and no boat out there had any lights. The only light they had on was on the stern of the boat to show the name of the boat. And we had to go out and find the boat. And this is a big bay, it's huge. And uh, just go out there. And we'd go out there and they'd count how many boats, they'd figure out how many boats they're supposed to have out there. And as soon as all the boats were in position, the lights would come on. We'd do work as hard and fast as we could for about two hours there, get the boats all loaded up, and as soon as everybody's loaded up, all the lights would go off and we'd pull away and go back to shore. And I did that a whole year. But nobody asked me what I did in Vietnam. Not one person when I came home. They just took it for granted that I did all that junk that they saw on TV, which I didn't, and looped us all together in one place. And that was a bad part. Stereotype us all alike. So we're really trying. We are. We're trying to live. We're trying to get ourselves back to where we thought we were before we went there. And we're not the same. We weren't the same people that came back home after that. And we're still not the same people. So thanks for being here. Thanks for letting us have our say. And, you know, tomorrow is Veterans Day. Remember those who have gone before you. And those who have served, thank you for serving. Because it is a big thing. Without your service, we don't enjoy the freedom that we enjoy today. And we won't have Donald Trump up there either, doggone it. <laughs> hey, thank you, Fred. Any other comments? Yeah, I just want to tell the group here, people who are listening to us talk here, I have this guys I grew up with, went to grade school and parish high school. Oh. I wish I had them over in Nama in the same squad and somebody would have been hurting over there and I don't that for a fact. But I was in the National Guard and I had guys from Huna, we kick butt. And when I knew from Nam, we kick butt over here in the National Guard, all the way up to up north, the Eskimos and all of them fell there, Stin, especially the airborne that came up. 172nd, my brother 
When this, just two of us here, right? When the guard with 297. But I wouldn't mind having all these guys over in Nam with me at the same time. I looked all over the 101st, nobody from Alaska. So, and happy birthday to the Marines. Thanks again, Ozzy. Okay. Hi. Thank you. I needed to tell you um, a story of my cousins. I'm from Cake. My name is Jackie Martin. Um, I have four, had four cousins who went to Vietnam. Their names are Tyrone, Roderick, Henrich, and Keith. And when they all made it to, went to Vietnam and they came home, uh, my cousins and I were very close. Uh, one of the, my cousins, Broderick, I'm very thankful that um, I have Harold Martin, my husband. Um, my cousin felt that he could come to our home and speak with him. And during that time that he spoke with my with Harold, he uh, there was construction going on at Cake, and they were blowing uh, dynamite, and they set one off, and my cousin jumped underneath the under our table, and Harold spoke with him and talked to him and and brought him down to um, back to us after listen, listening to your story and watching it on a screen, I knew, I now know where my cousin was, that he was back in Vietnam fighting for his life. And I, I'm so thankful that you're here, that you came home and you, you're alive and you're with your family and they get to know you. Because my cousins, all four of them, took their own life. They could not make it. So I thank you very much for not only um, fighting in the war for our country, and, and I thank you for coming back to be with your family. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. And if you all know, this is Jackie from Cake, but her grandma's from Huna. Jackie's Chukunadi, so she's kind of like our, all of our grandmas out there talking to us. Harold, Harold Duckdain Tan from Cake. Thank you, Ozzy. I come from a <clears throat> military family. I, there was eight boys in my family, and every one of us served in the military. We cover all wars from World War II up to the present time. I had many nephews and even some nieces that served in the military. But I just wanted to congratulate you sitting up there for surviving. At our meeting upstairs, I mentioned that I thank God for all these Vietnam veterans that came back home. They survived. They survived the horrors of combat. And if you watch the movie, they're still trying to survive. It's not easy to readjust to civilian life, even for a non-combatant. It's always a struggle. Anyway, I just want to thank you. My wife and I were born in Cake, born and raised in Cake, but uh, my mom was from Huna. So was uh, her mom. And how we met each other, I don't know. It's kind of a very <laughs> small percentage for two people from Luna to meet each other like this in cake. Thank you, Ozzy. Hey, thank you, Harold. Uh, it, the movie, the documentary has showed how many people were in Vietnam. But of all those people over there, only five were lost from Southeast Alaska out of all those people. We had lost one from Metlakatla, or Brother Bobby's brother. Um, one from Heidelberg, 
Petersburg, Craig, and Juno. I went from Huna. That's everybody from Southeast Alaska. We lost. Oh, I think we're at what then? Getting any comments? Are we done? Are we done? What? Any other comments? I think we'll have Ed. Most honorable, honorable of honorable men. I can't tell you how proud I am of you. I can't tell you the, the sorrow I feel in my heart for you, for all that you have gone through. I know each and every one of you I don't know if you remember that Al McKinley was sent to war because he was going with another eagle. <laughs> so I, I know the Huna boys. I don't know that you know that when you went away that we used to have these ceremonies in the A and B. And I remember the one that we had in cake where a candle was lit for every young man that was in Vietnam. That whole gymnasium was lit up with all of our Clinket and Haida young men that were sent to a war that we didn't even know anything about. I will tell you that it really affected me that I saw so many of our young men having to leave our villages. And I ran up to John Hope, and John Hope was working at the Selective Service. And I said, John Hope, what is it? Is this country trying to kill all of our people in the way that they tried to kill us before? I was so angry. I was angry that you were all taken away from us. But I didn't understand. I really have to say that I didn't understand what motivated you to do that. To make the ultimate sacrifice. To put your life on the line. I didn't understand all of that. I didn't understand the grief, the horror, the agony you must have felt until I saw this film. I don't think I understood the depth of your anguish. And the first time that I saw it, I could barely talk. The second time, I could talk a little bit more. But I just want to tell you how much, how much I honor you. But I also want to tell you I apologize to you. I apologize to you on behalf of our own people. I apologize for not recognizing the true sacrifice that you had. I apologize that when I saw homeless vets on the street, that I wasn't more compassionate, that I didn't do more for you. I apologize for all of our people who stood back and in our ignorance not understanding the sacrifice that you made. Noble men, noble men, I will tell you that you are going to live in the hearts of our people. I promise you that we are going to write about you that we are going to include you in our history, in the history that our children are going to learn about the sacrifices that you made. I, I just cannot tell you how much I apologize to you for our ignorance, for not supporting you. But I will vow to you 
that I will join the ranks of people like Bill Thomas. I know that Bill Thomas has been fighting for the vets. And maybe I used to let him stand by himself when in the legislature, when he tried to get housing, when he tried to get Vietnam or vets places up in Haines. I promise you that we are going to stand beside you in a way that we never stood beside you in the past. And I will tell you that when I see you dance at celebration, when I see you dance as a group of people, I am going to make all of our people stand for every time that I see you dancing for our culture, for our future. So I just want to say to you my very deepest thanks. And I cannot tell you how very humbled I am in learning more about that anguish that you went through. And I want you to know that we are all here beside you. Thank you for making this film. Thank you for that filmmaker who had the courage, you know, to make that film. Because it's the first time that we've ever seen into the souls of our people that went over there. Gunnarshish. Gunnarshish, Rosita. Thank you guys through here. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, we're done now. Gunnarshish. We're going to have our chaplain, Ed Coons, close us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for being here with us. Today, we heard your voice and all the speakers. We ask for our blessing on each house represented here. And we ask that you remain with us for the rest of the day. And we ask that you put your hand of protection on each one of us as we return to our own homes. These things we ask in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. <laughs>